بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Dear colleagues we are continuing the uh, thoracic imaging lectures and today we are going to discuss the issue of intervention and radiology Actually, this uh, lecture is uh, designed to give uh, you, as a radiologist and also as a clinician, the most uh, common available uh, interventional diagnostic techniques for uh, 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 different thoracic diseases, so that you can uh, select one of these uh, interventional techniques whenever it is relevant to your uh, battery of evaluation and uh, the lecture will not help you to perform these techniques actually and uh, anyone who wants to perform these interventional techniques should have a practical uh, training and um, this is available everywhere in in the world but uh, this is as i have said is to give you the overview about the available techniques you can order or you recommend in your report for the physician to go with uh, these procedures to reach to reach the final uh, diagnosis uh, the interventional techniques we usually perform in the chest include uh, the most common procedure which is the uh, trans uh, thoracic percutaneous needle biopsies of pulmonary uh, parenchymal lesions, also uh, the biopsy of mediastinal uh, masses, and the uh, percutaneous management of pleural collections, as well as management of intrapulmonary air and the fluid collections. And finally, the uh, pulmonary interventional angiographic techniques, including the bronchial and the pulmonary embolotherapy. Then uh, the first uh, technique we, uh, uh, which is very common and uh, is uh, performed uh, every now and uh, uh, this technique is the uh, percutaneous uh, CT or imaging guided needle biopsy actually. I will uh, handle here the issue of CT guided biopsy because this is uh, the way I perform in the interventional techniques myself and I don't have enough experience in the ultrasound and uh, actually the uh, MRI guided needle biopsies is not uh, yet available in my country. Then the, the indications for uh, needle uh, guided biopsy include evaluation of pulmonary nodules or masses confirming the diagnosis of metastatic lung disease staging of lung cancer sampling of suspected uh, inflammatory lesions in the lung and in some cases of diffuse lung disease we may go to uh, core biopsy in order to reach a final diagnosis especially in some cases of interstitial pulmonary parenchymal lesions also diagnosis of uh, mediastinal uh, masses and uh, in cases of focal or diffuse uh, pleural thickening we may also be able to have biopsies to confirm or to exclude the, the uh, diagnosis of mesothelioma for example then uh, as you can see here this is one of the ways of uh, uh, biopsying a posteriorly located uh, pulmonary nodule which is uh, suggested from the imaging criteria to be a bronchogenic carcinoma as i have said that you know if you are sure about the diagnosis of bronchogenic carcinoma from the imaging and the clinical picture and you should have a needle guided biopsy to confirm the diagnosis and then to know the cell type as i have mentioned in the lecture of a diagnosis and the staging of lung cancer and sometimes you may need to have biopsy such a lesion which is a batch in the lung showing air bronchogram may represent the mnemonic batch but whenever the patient is subjected for the uh, possible treatment for pneumonia and that the lesion that did not resolve or even is uh, fulminating or uh, progressing 
then you, you, you should know the exact underlying pathology. And you may need sometimes to biopsy such a lesion. Then uh, this is a, a lesion which is approached from uh, the back. I will, I will mention in details the, the technique. And in, in such a lesion where uh, a cavity is present or bronchiectasis are seen inside the lesion, you should try to avoid the uh, areas of cavitation or breakdown and you want to hit the wall of the cavity because here you can have a sample of viable cells and you can reach the uh, pathologic uh, diagnosis. Then uh, before you are going to biopsy a lesion in the chest, you should have first the adequate clinical data and uh, you should know the most likely radiological diagnosis from the films. You should inspect the films to, to design the approach for your needle, whether it is an anterior approach or posterior approach or lateral approach according to the accessibility of the lesion. Then uh, if the patient is on anticoagulant therapy for any reason, he should discontinue this treatment for five days before the procedure. In many institutions, the consent uh, signed by the patient or his relative uh, should be available uh, before the exam. Then you should have a look on the coagulation profile of the patient, especially the prothrombin time and concentration, as well as the INR. The previous uh, CT scan or the previous imaging techniques should be available for planning a safe approach for your, uh, your needle. Then um, if you look here, and uh, this is an example of an anteriorly located uh, lesion and it is intimately related to the chest wall, there is no uh, lung tissue across the needle uh, track and uh, th this is a good approach rather than the posterior one or the lateral one where you should bust through the pulmonary parenchyma to reach the need uh, to reach the lesion then uh, lesions abutting the uh, vascular uh, major vascular structures like the, in this case you are here in the region of the uh, uh, brachiocephalic uh, trunk and uh, the brachiocephalic artery as well then in order not to puncture one of the important vessels whenever the lesion is uh, adjacent to an area of uh, major vessels you should inject the contrast material to identify clearly the lesion separable from these vessels also whenever you are suspecting that the lesion you are going to biopsy is a vascular malformation then you should inject the contrast media and perform a dynamic study to be sure that this lesion is not a vascular malformation. Also suspected hypervascular lesions like the deposits or some uh, malignancies you may need to inject contrast media sometimes but uh, this is not the usual uh, case. Then. Uh, the coagulation profile is very important and the INR uh, should uh, 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 be less than 1.3 and the prothrombin concentration should be above 70% in order to, to be more or less safe whenever you are biopsying the lesion. But if the INR is more than 1.3 and the prothrombin concentration is less than 70%, then you have a great uh, in incidence to develop uh, post-procedure bleeding or uh, bleeding during the procedure itself. Also, if you have an emphysematous bulla or a severe uh, lung uh, emphysema, in the needle pathway, you should be uh, very cautious about puncturing these uh, emphysematous bully or, or puncturing a vascular structure in the needle pathway. This will uh, result in the first case uh, uh, of emphysema of the pneumothorax and in the second case it will result in bleeding. Then uh, if the patient is unable to cooperate then we may have to give him uh, general anesthesia for uh, the duration of the procedure which is about 15 to 20 minutes then uh, this will help you to uh, uh, 
reach the lesion if uh, the patient is incoperable. Then there are a lot of ways to guide your needle for uh, the bio to biopsy the lesion, like the uh, fluoroscopy, the ultrasound, and the CT scan. Actually, uh, the fluoroscopy guided biopsy is now uh, contraindicated because under fluoroscopy you are not sure about the nature of the lesion. It may be an aneurysm, it may be an arteriovenous malformation, then you will, you will do a catastrophe to the patient. Then the uh, uh, most reliable techniques include the ultrasound and CT and maybe recently MRI. And uh, as I have said, I don't have enough experience with ultrasound. Then I perform all the techniques using the CT guidance. And this is uh, one of the most uh, reliable uh, biopsy needle, core biopsy needles available in the market, which uh, here you can see different uh, lengths of the needle and you see the graded uh, scale on the needle itself to know the distance where uh, you are putting the needle inside the human body and also you got different calibers of the needle uh, starting from uh, the common gauges available the 18, 16 and 14 uh, gauge needle biopsies of course whenever you go to the 14 gauge needle biopsy you got to be a very big core as you can see and with, with the 16 uh, gauge needle uh, biopsy you got a smaller core which is uh, also a, a, a enough for uh, histo histopathologic evaluation then uh, this is the way in, uh, to, to have the, uh, the biopsy needle and you have the, the you, you have the biopsy needle with two needles inside each other then you uh, puncture the skin and uh, introduce the needle, both needles uh, within each other until you reach the uh, edge of the lesion. Then you push the inner needle to be uh, inside the lesion. Then you fire the, uh, the, uh, the needle in order to cut a part of the lesion and go inside the uh, outside needle then you draw both needles outside and here this is the technique you review the previous imaging studies then you uh, put the patient in the position which is uh, uh, accessible for bobs and uh, we have uh, emphasized the importance uh, of the accessibility of the lesion or the intimate relation of the lesion to the chest wall and also uh, uh, the, the absence of any emphysematous bully or uh, major vascular structures in the needle tract. And also you, as you, you, you should emphasize that there is no bone or uh, rib obstructing your pathway to the, to the knee. Then you put the patient in the position where, which, which was selected according to the site of the needle according to the site of the lesion. Then the patient may lie supine like this one and this one is also supine or prone or sometimes you put the patient in the lateral decubitus position and the side of the lesion is above. Then ensure the shortest and the most vertical pathway and uh, uh, provided the vertical approach is the most easy one. But whenever you are uh, uh, you are uh, you are selecting an, an oblique approach like this, then the, the adjustment of the angle of the needle will be somewhat difficult. Then uh, localization scan is obtained to identify the site of skin entry, and you mark the site of the skin entry by by a marker on the skin of the patient. Then you 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 perform an adequate sterilization of the site of entry and they give some local anesthesia. Then you uh, measure the distance from the skin to the central part of the lesion and you mark this distance on the uh, needle and you push your needle inside the lesion then you take a section or if you have a fluoroscopy CT you can see the introduction of the needle until it reaches the site of the lesion. 
then you push the inner uh, needle and you got your core and you go out after that then you have a post biopsy uh, scans to be sure that there are no uh, complications and this is the uh, skin marker about the site of the entry and you measure the uh, the site of the entry from the midline you calculate this distance on the film this is the midline and this is the site of puncture of the needle and you measure the distance here is about say it's three centimeter and you measure three centimeter and you do some local anesthesia like here and then you push your needle to the uh, direction of the uh, of, of the lesion then this is one of the most important issues and whenever you are biopsying a lesion which is intimately related to the aorta or to the pulmonary artery if you put the, the your needle in a vertical direction then if you uh, miscalculate the depth of the lesion you may puncture the aorta itself then uh, it's better to align the lesion so that if you introduce the needle more than enough it will not hit one of the major vascular structures and sometimes we go from the lateral approach like this one uh, avoiding the, the vessels in the axilla as well because this lesion is relatively nearer to the chest wall from the anterior approach or the posterior approach then this is what we call the lateral decubitus position sometimes especially the lesions which are uh, uh, hidden underneath the scapula and uh, in the uh, uh, posterior approach or the anterior approach you will pass a long distance into the pulmonary barring then you put the patient in the lateral decubitus and uh, aiming to displace the scapula more anteriorly then you can access the lesion uh, in between in the intercostal space as you can see here and the needle has no bark through the lung tissue itself then uh, this is the a, a lesion which is posteriorly located in the uh, lower lung lobe and we put the patient in the prone position and this is the needle passing a little bit through the lung parenchyma hitting the lesion and you can easily appreciate this opacity which means some bleeding in the pulmonary parenchyma here then after removal of the needle taking the biopsy and you you should have scans to ensure uh, if there are any uh, complications and in this patient you can see some pneumothorax has developed after removal of the needle and you can if you look to the opposite lung and you can see these emphysematous changes which are the major cause of uh, pneumothorax in most of the uh, of the cases then uh, uh, what are the causes of uh, pneumothorax actually the incidence of pneumothorax in uh, CT guided needle biopsies of pulmonary parenchymal lesions ranges uh, from 0 to 6 to 1 with an average 30 percent in all cases and of these 30 percent of cases about 6 to 7 percent require uh, insertion of an intercostal uh, chest tube these are the risk factors of developing a pneumothorax number one is the old age number two the presence of chronic obstructive pulmonary airway disease and of course emphysema intractable cuff and the lesion, the lesion is deeply seated and you see here this is an example you see this uh, lymph node or mass which is uh, present in the subcranial area and you want to hit this mass you will go a long distance through the lung and this is the needle and you can see that the needle hitting actually the lesion but uh, the patient developed a large amount of pneumothorax because you have a long pathway through the lung parenchyma in, uh, until you reach the site of the lesion and then if the lesion is small and you have uh, uh, done multiple trials to hit the lesion or to take an adequate biopsy then the incidence of pneumothorax will increase also if you miss select a needle with of a large caliber and uh, it will increase the incidence of pneumothorax and i usually recommend the 19 or maximum 18 gauge needle 
for uh, doing uh, lung biopsies, especially whenever you are traversing lung parenchyma uh, while approaching the lesion itself. Also, uh, if you are biopsy, biopsying a cavitary lesion, you, you may have the a chance to uh, put your needle inside the cavity and then you got some air leakage and you need the incidence of pneumothorax in this case will be high. Then uh, hemorrhage is the second most common complication uh, of uh, transrustic uh, needle biopsies and uh, the risk uh, uh, of hemorrhage increases with unsatisfactory lab results. The coagulation profile is not good. The uh, biopsying of vascular lesions Biopsying is small mediastinal masses which are intimately related to the major vessels, the use of large caliber needle, and of course the multiple trials. And this is an example. You have uh, a, a, this patient had a mass which is posterior to the superior vena cava and anterior to the hemiazygous vein. Then you cannot hit the mass from anterior or from posterior because of these major vascular structures then the only way is to cross the whole lung in order to reach this lesion deeply seated in the mediastinum. And whenever you go a long distance into the lung, the incidence of pneumothorax increases and also the incidence of lung pulmonary hemor parenchymal hemorrhage increases. And these arrowheads point to an area of uh, pulmonary parenchymal bleeding secondary to this uh, needle. Then, other complications are uh, considered very rare or even extremely rare, like the uh, the malignant uh, spread of uh, malign spread of malignant cells along the needle track, which is very rare, and the, the incidence of air embolism is also very rare. Then the mortality rate of uh, as a complication of transthoracic needle guided biopsy is about uh, uh, 0.02 percent. And the causes of uh, mortality are tension pneumothorax, major hemorrhage, cardiac tamponade, and air embolism. Of course, the biopsy of uh, mediastinal lesions is a little bit more difficult because of the intimate relation of the lesions to the major vascular structures in the mediastinum. Then, uh, the same way as for, as for uh, needle guided biopsy of pulmonary parenchymal lesions uh, are followed including the assessment of the clinical condition, uh, evaluation of the site and the, the size of the lesion, and uh, uh, the, the essential need for injection of contrast medium in order to clarify the major vascular structures which are in the vicinity of the lesion itself. Then we have different approaches in, for uh, biopsying mediastinal uh, lesions. Uh, like the parasternal or the transsternal, the suprasternal, paravertebral, transpleural, and transpulmonary approaches. And this is an example of a parasternal uh, approach, and you pass your needle in an oblique way so that if you uh, go deep, you will not hit the arch of the aorta, for example. And this arrowhead point to the internal mammary artery, which should be avoided actually whenever you are introducing your needle to biopsy such lymph nodes in the prevascular uh, area. Then uh, this is the transsternal approach, and you uh, insert first a coaxial uh, needle of large caliber through the sternum after uh, determining the root of uh, your needle. Uh, approach to the lesion, and this is the retrocaval lymph node, this is the arch of the aorta, and this is the superior vena cava. Then uh, you put the coaxial needle, and through it you push your needle, your biopsy needle, to hit the lesion. Then uh, the suprasternal approach, and in in here you have multiple lesions, and you have an artery, and you have a vein. Actually, the importance of injection of contrast media is very clear here and um, you, you put your needle above the manubrium sterni then you in an oblique way down down downward you push your needle until you reach your uh, your target then uh, the paravertebral approach usually you insert your needle uh, as much as you can very close to the spine in order not to pass through the pulmonary parenchyma itself 
then uh, in many times you have uh, uh, the cost of vertebral junction you have osteophytes protruding from the vertebral body which may uh, uh, obstruct your needle pathway uh, to the site of the lesion and uh, many of the uh, interventional thoracic radiologists uh, uh, sometimes inject a little amount of saline into the pleural space to initiate a, a, a track for the needle to pass through in order to displace the lung away from the needle pathway. I, I actually myself I, I didn't perform this procedure but in, uh, in many cases I try to go uh, very uh, close to the spine in the paravertebral gutter. I know you, you are here in the plural space and away from the lung and this is a, a mass in the subcarinal area and uh, this is a very good approach actually uh, which is away from the lung and the incidence of pneumothorax is nil in these conditions and uh, this what I have said you, uh, you may have the costovertebral articulation as an obstacle uh, to uh, reach this uh, mass in the retrocaval area or uh, sometimes in old age you got osteophytes which uh, may obstruct the needle pathway to hit the, uh, the, the lesion of anterior. Then we came to the drainage of pleural collections and actually we drained the insisted collections and the emboemas but the free pleural collection are, is usually drained by the cardiothoracic surgeons through insertion of the in intercostal tube and sometimes we may uh, ask it to, to uh, drain some of pleural collection in a patient with a very bad general condition. He cannot uh, uh, he cannot uh, tolerate the insertion of a, uh, an intercostal tube. Then we we put our needle and uh, try to use some valves in order not to introduce air inside the pleural space and we aspirate as much as we can uh, from this uh, pleural fluid in order to improve the, uh, the patient uh, uh, shortness of breath uh, which is a, a, a temporary procedure not a, aiming to drain the whole collection but in cases of insisted uh, collection or in cases of embryoma like this where you can see enhancement of the pleural reflections and the, the presence of multiple air loculi inside the embryoma itself we may insert, in, insert a big tail catheter percutaneously and leave it for two or three days in order to ensure adequate uh, training, uh, draining. This is what I mean by the uh, big tail catheter which is a catheter with big tail as you can see and inside you have two needle, uh, metallic needle cores and whenever you push these uh, needles you, uh, you will got a straight catheter and this catheter is inserted percutaneously into the collection then you remove the metallic cores and you, you got the big tail once more inside the lesion you connect it to the drainage bag and uh, leave it until complete drainage then uh, uh, this, this is good for the recent uh, plural collections which uh, has not yet developed uh, fibrosis or loculation or uh, uh, interceptations uh, inside the collection itself. If so, and you are draining a collection which is relatively old, then you may have to inject some uh, of the uh, fibrinolytic uh, materials like streptokinase or others in order to uh, remove some of the uh, fibrotic bands to ensure adequate uh, uh, drainage. Then uh, you know that uh, chronic lung cavities may develop inside the fungal bowl and uh, the fungal bowl as you know is known as mycetoma or aspergilloma and uh, this is a major cause of hemoptysis and hemoptysis may be massive and uh, may result in death of the patient then uh, in order to prevent this complication we want to kill this fungus inside the cavity and one of these uh, techniques to kill the fungus is to inject an antifungal drug inside the cavity 
uh, too many times or, uh, or on several s settings in order to, to ensure adequate uh, killing of the uh, fungus itself. Then the drug is known as amphitrocine B and is dissolved in saline and injected uh, through a catheter, fine catheter introduced inside the cavity where the fungal ball is present. Then uh, here you can see uh, the cavity which is free of fungus after uh, death of the, fung of the fungus itself upon uh, multiple uh, injections of amphotericine B uh, and this, uh, this uh, drug may be uh, uh, labeled with uh, gel or libidol in order to prolong its uh, effect inside the cavity on the fungus itself. Then we came to the uh, 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 vascular interventions and they are, there are two main goals for the vascular intervention. Number one is the opening of an occluded vessel, which is a technique commonly used for uh, uh, embolectomy of the uh, major pulmonary emboli in the major pulmonary vessels. And actually, I, I don't know exactly if this technique is uh, performed in my country or not, but I am sure that it is not performed by the radiologist, maybe uh, performed by the cardiothoracic surgeons, for example. Mm -hmm. Then uh, this technique is commonly uh, uh, done, which uh, in, entails occlusion of any of these structures, occlusion of arterial venous malformation or aneurysm or bleeding vessels or vascular tumors before surgical resection. And the embolotherapy, we use this, uh, this technique to uh, occlude uh, like uh, the pulmonary arterial venous malformation or uh, pulmonary artery aneurysm, for example. And uh, these are the, the causes uh, uh, like TB, lung abscess, sarcoid, aspergilloma, bronchogenic carcinoma, coronic uh, infection, cystic fibrosis, uh, pneumoconiosis. And uh, uh, in, in, in these conditions, if there is an incidence of bleeding for a, a reason or other, then we may introduce our catheters to occlude the bleeder. And this is an example of an arterio, two arteriovenous malformations. One is large and a smaller one and maybe a third one here. And the, you may use for the occlusion of these pulmonary vascular malformation steel coils, as you can see here. And also, uh, uh, you remember I have uh, mentioned this example before, which is a pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysm secondary to bronchogenic carcinoma. This patient had a bronchogenic carcinoma on the right upper lobe that has eroded the pulmonary artery on the right side with the resultant small pseudoaneurysm here, which is amenable for rupture any time then uh, the risk of major hemorrhage is uh, great in such conditions and we introduce a catheter to uh, uh, demarcate the site of the aneurysm and then we put a lot of uh, steel coils in at the site of the aneurysm and the pulmonary artery to prevent the risk of bleeding. Pulmonary artery venous malformations, I have mentioned uh, a lot of a lot, a lot of information about these uh, lesions in the lung and uh, uh, actually you remember that uh, this was an old technique to diagnose the pulmonary vascular malformation is to insertion of a catheter into the pulmonary artery injection of contrast media so that you can see the feeding artery, the AVM and the draining vein. But uh, for the diagnosis now, we use the multi-detector CT and also we can use the MR angiogram to uh, confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial venous malformation. Actually, there are a lot of complications for the uh, pulmonary arterial venous malformations like the embolic strokes and transient ischemic attacks. Also, the development of brain abscesses secondary to uh, uh, passage of the pulmonary a septic emboli through the artery direct into the vein and so on. Then, 
This is an example of brain abscess secondary to this small artery venous malformation, which has been occluded by steel coil, as you can see here. This is the pre-embolization angiogram. This is the feeding artery, and this is the AVM, and this is the vein. Then, after occlusion, you can, you can see no flow through the vascular malformation. Also here you can see a, a, a small arterial venous malformation in this uh, CT scan and uh, this is the angiogram showing the feeding artery, the AVM and the draining vein and this is the occlusion of the feeding artery by steel coils. Then uh, you have two uh, vascular malformations here. One is the small, which has been occluded by steel coil. One is large, which has been occluded by detachable balloon. And this is the patient with uh, hereditary hemorrhagic transectasia with multiple pulmonary arteriovenous malformations, as you can see here. And uh, this is the uh, post embolization angiogram showing uh, occlusion of all vascular malformations using steel coils. Then, what are the criteria of uh, uh, accurate uh, treatment of arteriovenous malformation? Number one is absence of any flow across the lesion after six months from the embolization date. Then a stable arterial blood oxygen uh, level for one year, and uh, the X-ray and this multi-detector CT showed no lesion and uh, no flow across the site of the lesion. Then here you can see this is a, a post-embolization X-ray, CT, and angiogram showing no flow in the region of the uh, vascular uh, malformation. والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين